Welcome back. We're talking with Tasha and Allison from Interact. Their organization's mission is threefold, save lives, rebuild lives, and secure safer futures for victims and survivors and their families. Now, if there's anyone watching at home, you know who you should contact. And uh, I'm gonna tell you something, I'm sure everyone knows somebody who's involved in a relationship that maybe they view as abusive, but yet the victim doesn't, doesn't see that. I'm gonna be a little selfish here, and I'm, I'm gonna ask you, you know, from somebody who sees something happening in my world, what do I do? Mm -hmm. What are the signs? Mm -hmm. What can a family member or someone who loves somebody who's involved in a relationship like that do? That's such an important question because as friends and family members of someone in a situation like this, you may be one of their only supports. And so it's really important that once you do recognize some of those things that are potentially happening in a relationship, maybe you see things like isolation, they're not coming around as much anymore, um, extreme jealousy or controlling behavior on behalf of the partner. You know, it's important to be a support for that friend, that friend or family member. How do you do that? The best way to do it is to listen, you know, to reassure your family member that, that if this is not their fault, they are not causing this, that there are resources out there to help them, uh, that they may want to start thinking through. They may not be at the point where they're ready to make a decision about what they want to do, but you could encourage them to maybe seek out more information about, you know, what are your options if you do choose to leave? What are your options to stay safe if you choose to stay? You know, I would recommend never telling someone what they should do. They're experts in their situation, and that's also going to create distance between um, you and the victim, which is important to be a support and to recognize that they are the experts in their situation, that they are potentially in a very volatile, um, high-risk situation, and they need support to get out if they choose that this is the time to get out for them. So don't isolate them. Right, don't isolate them. No, no don't, ultimatums. Don't, yeah, no ultimatums. Don't be a part of that cycle where you are feeding into that isolation. We know that victims, when they leave, often go back for the reasons that we've discussed. They can't financially make it. It's more dangerous. You know, so recognizing that, you know, be as supportive to them and be as willing to be there for them on the fourth time that they leave as you were on the f first, because that's when they're really going to need it. Well, I'll tell you, if you're at home now and you're, you're thinking, well, I know people like this, or, gosh, you want to help, mm -hmm. uh, there's lots of ways to do that. In fact, we're going to talk about that in a second, but I'd like to go and catch up with Jessica again, because she shared with us uh, what people... Uh, and her perceptions of the people, and what really volunteering meant to her, and how it actually, I guess, healed her. Absolutely. Here's Jessica, watch. I came here originally for counseling nine years ago when everything, it was a few months after everything had happened when my jaw was broken. Um, and then I actually didn't get involved with volunteering until a few years later. I wasn't, I've only, I've been sharing my story for um, three years. Um, I often hear that they don't expect a victim or survivor to look like me. They, I don't know what they expect, but that's kind of, I think everyone kind of has an idea of what a victim of domestic violence looks like. And apparently it's not me. <laughs> that's what I hear often. I think I went through a really long period where I was in survival mode and I was just really focused on like my kids being good and like everything being good. And then it was probably in 2011, 2012, um, I actually, little side story, I went to donate blood and my blood pressure was really high and I couldn't donate and I went to the doctor and there was no medical reason for my blood pressure to be high. And he did some testing and it was that I was, because I had been through so much trauma that I was in like constant fight or flight mode. So I did some trauma informed therapy and that really led me to like a good healing place where every time I tell this story, it like softens the pieces of it a little bit as it comes out and it heals me a little bit more. Oh. Amazing story. Just the thing I'm taking away from all of this is, I never thought about this. People have a certain perception, I guess, of what a domestic victim should look like or act like. And of course, there really isn't, is there? Absolutely not. We know that a, um, the victims that come in to interact look like everyone in our community. Um, there's not a single gender, race, um, ethnicity. Um, it doesn't really matter what kind of education background you have, um, spiritual status. background, mm -hmm. socioeconomic status. People have an equal chance of being a victim of domestic or sexual violence. Oh, well, that's amazing. Well, the other part of the story was how she um, really didn't realize that she was still in this fight or flight uh, type of mode that it was affecting her uh, mm -hmm. physically. 
but volunteering did, a, did an awful lot of good for her. Mm -hmm. And I know you guys probably need volunteers, don't you? We do, and we are so grateful for Jessica. Um, she's been an incredible volunteer for us at Interact and always willing to help out. And, um, and really, we have so many people just like her. Um, there are, are, is not a single job at Interact that's done by a staff member that we also don't have volunteers working in that same capacity, be it answering the crisis lines, helping with our emergency shelter, um, coming in and helping um, with our children's support groups. There are so many ways. Um, we call those the deep dive, the people mm -hmm. who really come in and um, receive extensive training, work one-on-one -on -one with clients. But we also have people who um, maybe don't have that availability or are nervous about really getting engaged in that way. Um, and those folks will help us with filing and with um, working in our thrift store, all sorts of ways that people can help, um, either with clients or on the other side of things where it might be mm -hmm. um, less with clients, but still super important. Well, I get a sense that, and I can see it in your eyes, the difference it's mm. made in your lives. It must do, that must be some satisfaction in volunteering. I'm so sorry that you're so busy, though. <laughs> I really am. But thank you so much for being there. If people want to uh, call you, either they need to get out of a situation or volunteer, what's the best way to get a hold of you? Well, we have our 24-hour crisis lines, mm -hmm. and we have those staffed, you know, um, with someone who can absolutely help direct someone if they are in a situation, if they're a family member and they're interested in more information how they can help, or if they'd like to get involved. Um, we also have our website that's a great place to start for um, information as well. Beautiful. Well, thank you so much for being thank here you. and for what you do. <laughs> thank you. And thank you for watching. And hey, listen, there's help just to get a hold of Interact. We hope you enjoyed today's show. And if you have any questions or would like to know more, just visit our website at RaleighCW.com and MyRDCTV.com. And I'm Bill LeMay. Thank you for watching. Community Matters will be back next week. We'll see you then.